Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Always good to have you with us. Later on in the show, we're going to talk to a Brown University professor who is doing some really interesting research in collaboration with other academics and the Census Bureau, diving very, very deep into data at the neighborhood level about which areas of the country are doing well, which aren't, and which ones would give kids the best chances, especially ones who've come from less privileged backgrounds. So really interesting. We're going to talk about that, including local impacts. But first, I'm very pleased to be joined by a return visit, actually, for Ron Simino. He is the vice president of Shamit Design and Construction. They do a lot of big, big projects around here. And we're going to talk about some of those today. Ron, thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me back, Ted. So first of all, remind folks, I, I even as I was saying who was on today, people get confused between the, the people who run properties, the people who just build buildings. Remind people which part of that world Shamit is. So Shamit is a construction manager, a large, sophisticated construction manager. And basically, we run the process of construction but unlike a general contractor who get hired uh, after the drawings are done, we get hired when the architect's hired, and we help guide the project to stay on time, on budget, and we stay with it right through the completion. So. And I remember you and I talking last time, and I was actually a little surprised because it seems like you'd, you'd want the people who are going to build the building right there with the architect all along, but that is actually not always the case, and historically was not as often the case, right? Correct. Traditionally, it was definitely not the case. There was this friction that was kind of almost uh, deliberately placed between the design team and the and the builder, but more and more, the industry is trending towards collaboration, and that's that's getting far better results than the, the traditional method of delivery buildings. Um, so I want to talk a little about uh, you guys hitting 20 years in Rhode sure. Island. You, you just got there. How big, you know, you guys are all over the country. How mm -hmm. big is your operation uh, in Rhode Island right now, and, and what's been the, the drivers of growth there? Uh, we are uh, about $100 million a year. Uh, 100, uh, employ uh, 100 employees in Rhode Island, uh, and that's part of a much larger company. Obviously, we're, we're a national firm, about a $1.4 billion company. Um, and really, uh, we specialize, half of the company is focused on uh, locally on education, which is the largest sector in New England, um, as well as healthcare and life sciences and commercial development property. Um, the other half is uh, focused on high-end luxury uh, retail and hospitality work, and that's uh, really our national business. So um, we are thinking about, we're hearing a lot of different thoughts. We're talking here at the start of 2019 about where the economy is going. Mm -hmm. They often say sometimes that building can be the, the front edge of kind of what the trends are. So how was business in 2018 from Shama's perspective, and what's the outlook in your view for 2019? Uh, 2018 was a banner year, I think, for everybody. Um, the industry's been through unprecedented growth since the recession. Uh, 2018 was actually the peak in terms of construction starts for the state of Rhode Island. Uh, it usually takes uh, about three years for that revenue to actually play out into construction spending. Uh, it doesn't all get spent in the first year when the contracts are awarded. Um, the outlook's strong for the next couple of years, but uh, we're expecting the spending will be there, but it, the growth is flattening. Interesting. So, yeah, so and we, what we monitor really is the architects who are generally on the front end their buildings, so the architectural buildings are what really tells us that if there's less uh, design work happening, there's going to be less construction work in the pipeline. So, Because that suggests pulling back by, especially from your side, the institutional actors who decide if they're going to build some big new building or make something fancy or whatever? Yeah, the, the educational sector has traditionally been pretty uh, insulated from some of these economic downturns. Um, and there's certainly a lot of, they, they, they think in much longer lenses than developers do. So, um, and that's been the core of our business. And it's traditionally the core of the construction spending on the building side in any given city too. Let's talk a little about those because uh, I think the biggest project you're working on right now, maybe no surprise, is one with an educational partner. That's sure. with Brown University. Mm -hmm. We've, uh, at any given time, we've got a, probably a dozen projects going on up at Brown University. But the, the biggest one we're working on right now, we're just breaking ground on the new Performing Arts Center. Uh, we actually just relocated a building as part of the enabling phase. So a historic home, moved it down Sharp the street. Sharp House, right? Sharp House, yeah, yeah. We have a really neat time-lapse video of that. Nice, and you took it down the street so you could make room. Where, remind me, where will the Performing Arts Building be in, on the east side? Uh, it is directly adjacent to the Grand Off Center uh, for Creative Arts, so it's, it's right behind that. 
So you actually have an interesting deal with Brown because you kind of are sort of there. You're not in-house. You're your own company. But sure. you have this deal where they, they just go to you on each thing and you work with them across the many, many projects they're always doing, which has been, it sounds like, fairly successful for you guys to, to have that relationship. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we talked about the collaboration aspect and how the industry is moving in that direction. Brown is absolutely at the forefront of driving that. You look at the productivity of every other non-farm industry in the country, and it's more than doubled since the 1960s. Uh, construction has actually stayed flat, mm. and that's because of the constant, you hire a firm, you design it specifically, you put a team together, you build it, there's no economies to taking the lessons learned and through continuous improvement and moving it down. Now we're in a uh, strategic sourcing partnership with Brown where we're able to actually take the lessons learned to the next project. There's a tremendous amount of training, there's focus on lean from um, Toyota, uh, it's called Last Planner in Construction. Um, there's uh, different contract delivery models, uh, integrated project delivery and design build. So very highly collaborative models where uh, the design team and the CM both own not only the design and the program, but also the budget and the schedule. Yeah, you know, we have to go to break, but I, yeah. I'm always curious when I, so you'll drive through the east side when you guys are working on a project, and you are working sometimes in very tight spaces. I mean, Brown, you know, we're going back to colonial days when those streets were mapped right. out, and you'll be taking a building that's got very active uh, streets in front of it, a lot going on. Next. What are the challenges of doing a project in a dense urban environment, like when you're at Brown or when you're at RISD, for example, Sure. versus, you know, building a suburban campus out in a field somewhere. Sure. Well, obviously, safety to the overall, not just within the site, but to the overall public, and the impact is, is first and foremost. But traffic logistics, the impact on the businesses, where all the workers are going to park. You don't want the workers out on the sidewalk eating lunch and, uh, you know, harassing people as they're going by, especially in a, in a campus environment. So one of the things that we really excel at is how you build something. It's not just about what you build. There's a lot of great builders out there. But when how you build it and how you interact with the surrounding campus and communities is just as important as what you're building, that's really what we excel at. Interesting. All right, when we come back, we're going to talk more with Ron Simino about what they're up to at Shawmut, including their involvement in some of those big projects uh, that are reviving the 195 land, the old 195 land. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Later on in the show, we're going to talk to Brown University professor John Friedman about a very interesting project he and some other researchers are doing with the census, diving deep into the data on what makes different neighborhoods let kids thrive. And it's really interesting. We'll get to that. But right now, we're talking to Ron Simino. He is the vice president of Shamit Design and Construction. They do a lot of big projects, especially with the big colleges in Providence, Brown University uh, notable among them. Another project doing that it's adjacent to the education and stuff, but it's it's on its own in some ways too, is the Wexford building that people are seeing rising up there on the 195 land. Governors talked like crazy about this. She's very excited about it. it <clears throat> it's sort of the centerpiece of that hope of making the 195 land into an innovation area. What is unique about that project versus some of the other ones you're doing? What, what makes it stand out? I think a lot of it is uh, what's unique to really the Wexford partnership with the City of Providence. What they do, what they specialize in all over the country is, is building these kind of knowledge communities where you've got uh, a learning environment activated by uh, companies like Cambridge Innovation Center, um, and then you've got uh, living very close by. So it's really, this project is really the first of many projects or um, and it's closely tied to the Cell Street Landing Project. So you've got a lot of education kind of in a, in a small area. You've got living, um, you've got incubated space. It's, it's, it's really there to help fuel the economy. Yeah, it's really getting activated yeah. down there because South Street Landing, that's the old power station that became yep. the nursing school recently. And you guys are finishing <coughs> next door, what it's, they're calling it River House. It's a big right. st uh, student housing yep. thing. How's that? Is that on track to, when's that supposed to be up and running? Uh, that'll be turned over in May, uh, be hopefully leased out over the summer, but it's really geared towards graduate uh, mm -hmm. students. But um, it's more kind of high-end market rate housing, but it's... Uh, yeah, it's an exciting project. And what's absolutely. the timeline on Wexford? When do you see that one being done? Uh, the uh, the occupancy will be over the summer as well. So both the, the River House and the Innovation Center will probably be um, occupied. About so next time. fall is going to feel significantly yeah. different down in that area. You're looking there, there at a fairly recent picture of Wexford uh, a couple yeah. of months back, I think, and how that's uh, and it's even further along probably by the time people are seeing this. So if Wexford there, like we're talking about South Street Landings, just down the street. <laughs> yeah. The Brown Medical School, which is in some ways still fairly new, is right over in that area. Sure. So that's really been transformed, and you've kind of had a front row seat to watch that. Absolutely. Our office is kind of smack dab in the middle of that, so 
it uh, worked out pretty well. <laughs> so um, you've been at Shamit 24 years. Uh, you've been in, in this world, <clears throat> construction, uh, looking at how these projects are done. What's the biggest change you've seen over your now nearly quarter century with the company? Uh, well, the company's certainly grown, and um, what we've seen relative to the industry is just the uh, the transition from that kind of adversarial relationship of how construction was procured to really a highly collaborative um, level. And what's really exciting, that's really what we do. Um, unlike other construction companies that pursue big projects, we're really focused on building long-term client relationships, and we do big jobs, little jobs, jobs of all size, but it's all based on a long-term client relationship and therefore always bringing a long-term view to every interaction. So it's a different level of service. A challenge in your industry yeah. we heard about, we recently had on uh, the head of Sweener Builders, uh, and they've been working with this old house on some uh, interesting new ways of doing residential housing, uh, especially down by the coast, and he said that one of his prime concerns is worker pipeline, mm -hmm. is having enough younger folks coming into the trades to do, he, he was saying, uh, the difficulty they have, I remember him saying someone to make cabinets <clears throat> or uh, some of the electrical work, absolutely. things like that. Is that something you see too? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's certainly not enough new work is coming into the workforce. Uh, we've got uh, an aging workforce right now that's retiring. We're at the peak of the, the market right now, so uh, we're certainly feeling it. Uh, and it's certainly impacting pricing as well. It's subcontractors be very selective about what work they take. So having good relationships with subcontractors and, and really getting them interested in the jobs will, is what helps keep the pricing down. Why do you think that is? Historically, these were seen as good paying jobs, good ones potentially. Maybe if you didn't have a college degree, uh, you got trained up for this and this was one you could make a good living. Why do you think fewer, uh, you see fewer young people going into it? Uh, I think that there, we've kind of painted this American dream where everybody's got to go to college and uh, go off and get a great paying job. There are really fantastic careers to be had in the trades uh, without taking on all the debt associated with education. So when you do the ROI, um, it's really a good avenue to take. Anything you see uh, that's working well to, to start to build a pipeline? Any programs that are being done or any efforts you are undertaking at Shamit to try to build that pipeline up uh, on your own? Uh, sure. We, well, we participate in a, a great program in Rhode Island called the Ace Mentorship Program where you're really geared towards uh, getting the high school students interested in, in engineering uh, or, the, and or the trades kind of uh, at an early age. So, um, and that's really where you got to get to them before they decide to really get into college. So we are, we're just about out of time. I had to ask you about one big project. You have nothing to do with it right now, at least, but uh, it looms over the city, and I did a story in it recently, the Superman building, the old on uh, Westminster yep. Street. Um, w when you look at that, as someone who, who takes older buildings, and uh, the huge, decaying right now, I mean, what kind of a job would that be if something came together to redevelop it? It's certainly a beautiful building with a, a tremendous amount of historic value. It's iconic within the city of Providence. Uh, but unfortunately with these older buildings, there are so many uh, issues with relative to code and seismic, uh, and just bringing the, the infrastructure up to, to, to where it needs to be to actually really make it very useful um, is a challenge. It's a challenge. And then on top of that, whatever use it gets determined to be, there's going to be you know, changes that will need to be made for that. So it's. It's 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 tough. It'll be interesting to see what kind of uh, you know what kind of a use it winds up being ultimately. But it would be uh, it's a shame to see it unoccupied. Um, looking forward to seeing something happen with it. it. Sounds like could be an expensive project too, based on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Typically, those kinds of reservations could be could be challenging. Go pretty high. Well, maybe you'll get the contract and you can bring it in under I budget. Hope so. All I right, hope so. Ron Simino from Shamit Design and Construction. Thanks for joining me. Stick Thank with you. us though. Coming up next, we're going to talk about Brown. Talk to Brown Professor John Freeman about some of the cutting edge research he's working on. Stick with us. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi, and pleased to be joined now by Brown University economics professor John Friedman. And John's going to be talking today about, it's called the Opportunity Atlas, and it's also Opportunity Insights is kind of the umbrella that that's, that's under, right? right? And that's so right. Uh, you'll hear us reference different things, but day-to-day -day offices at Brown, right, John? That's right. So welcome. Thanks for being Thanks here. Thanks for having me. So let's talk about this. I've, I teed it up a little when I was previewing uh, you coming on. So people will hear, okay, some academics using census data, making maps, looking at the... 
Isn't that what they're always doing? What is unique about this project that makes it exciting to you and why it's got, it has gotten national attention? Yeah, so the key thing we're doing is we're trying to understand how neighborhoods differ, but not just on who lives there now. That's the type of thing I think people have done quite a lot. You see maps of poverty rates or uh, school rates or whatever. We're trying to see how neighborhoods do in terms of getting kids on a trajectory to really succeed later in life by looking back to see what kids grew up in which neighborhoods maybe 20 or 30 years ago and where they are now. So we can actually follow the kids over the course of their life and we see amazing differences in neighborhoods that I think you would not expect to have found just based on what everybody else has done. And in the simplest terms so people understand, how are you able to tell, you know, I know what neighborhood I grew up in and you could look now 30 years later and how am I doing and whatever. How, how are you able to do that? Yeah, so the, uh, there's been a revolution in IT in many fields, and it has not passed academics by. And so the US Census Bureau has collected amazing data sets over the years where we can actually follow kids as they move through life. We kind of know where they grew up. We know where they went to college. Not we with know their where, names, we should say. Not right? with their names, that's right. It's all working with anonymized data. But uh, for us, we don't need to know their names. We just need to know that they grew up in this neighborhood, and then they moved to that other neighborhood. And now they're living in Providence. And we can see, based on a, a wide range of outcomes, both uh, what kind of incomes they earn, whether they were incarcerated, whether uh, women have teenage pregnancies, really wide range of outcomes, you see these neighborhoods put kids on sharply different trajectories. So kind of the same way we know kind of what happened to the kids in the neighborhoods we all grew up in. You know, oh, Ted went, Ted ended up working at Channel 12, someone else is a teacher, someone's this, someone's that, and how they got there. You're kind of getting to look at that for all the kids that That's you have the exactly data for. Right. That's exactly right. So the other interesting thing about this, and again, part of why it's gotten, it's been in the New York Times a couple times and, and been written up elsewhere, is because there are real-world applications of this data for policymakers. Uh, one example I thought was fascinating, the housing authority in Seattle is going to use it or is using it to try to give vouchers to, to send people to the neighborhoods where the kids seem to be more successful. That's exactly right. And so housing voucher families get to choose where they live, but what we often find is that they choose to live in neighborhoods that aren't great for their kids' trajectories. Now, if it were the case that that were just the consequence of you know, having to find an affordable place, then maybe that would be one thing. But what we find is that there are all sorts of neighborhoods in cities where it's no more expensive than where those families are currently living, but they're much, much better in terms of setting their kids on that good trajectory. And this is super important because we sometimes will look at Providence, the poor parts of Providence, for example, and, and it sort of looks on paper when you look at poverty rates, something all the same. Like, oh, it's just, oh, those parts of the city have really struggled and, and we're not sure what we can do. But your data shows not all of these places with maybe lower incomes are created equal in terms of how the kids end up. That's the value of actually being able to look at these kids' outcomes rather than just trying to use proxies like the poverty rate or uh, single, fa single family parent share. We can see how the kids do and then we find that there are surprising neighborhoods, we call them opportunity bargains, where you might not have thought it would be a great place to live, but it turns out when you look more deeply, there's often a reason that they're, uh, you can understand why these kids are really doing well. And then of course our goal is not just to be able to help families locate and move to those types of neighborhoods when they want to, but to actually improve neighborhoods so that really we give all the kids a chance of being on that better trajectory. So we have a couple maps to give people a better idea. Now don't get overwhelmed, folks, because there's a lot on the map, so we're gonna leave them up and talk you through them. So the first one is the state of Rhode Island, and you're going to see Connecticut on one side and Massachusetts on the other. So you got Rhode Island right there in the middle. And John, give it, what are we looking at here? Yeah. People see the colors. You kind of go from a, a darker uh, greenish color on the one end down to an orange and yellow. What are we seeing there? Yeah, so what you're seeing is uh, each of the kind of colored shapes is a census tract. And census tracts are designed to have about the same number of families in them. So about 4,000 households uh, maybe have a couple hundred kids in our sample in the right age ranges. And so you can see that they're a little bit bigger in the rural areas where it's a little bit less dense and then they get pretty small when you get inside the city and uh, we can zoom in later and take a look at that. Then the coloring, it scales how those kids are doing from poor families that grow up in that neighborhood, uh, wherever they are later in life. We're measuring their earnings at about age 35. And the, the coloring gives you a sense of where those tracks rank to compare to the national distribution of, of tracks for similarly poor families. And so I think just one striking thing that you see is, you know, here in southern New England, 
We have the full range of colors from mm. deep red to deep uh, blue or green. Um, you see a ton of variation uh, here in Rhode Island. Western, and the deep uh, red is the places where the kids are having the least success. That's right. Deep red later. is bad, and then kind of the deeper blue or green is uh, is the are the good places. Um, and what you see is that it's not that. Uh, one side of the state is all one color and the other side of the state is all the other color. It's really a uh, patchwork and I think that's one of the surprising things we found is that if you're looking for an example of a high opportunity neighborhood right here in Rhode Island, you don't have to go really far away. You don't have to find the richest neighborhoods you can find. You don't have to go. Uh, it's, it's possible in almost any city and almost any setting to find a good example of a high opportunity neighborhood that's right close by. In that sense, it's a very hopeful message. That exactly. They, they, this is in people, it's attainable for people. Let's look at the other map, which is this is now greater Providence and some of the cities right around Providence. So right there in the middle, you're looking at uh, downtown Providence and you have Central Falls up in one corner. You're going out into uh, North Providence and Johnson and the other side. So what is this telling us about, especially there in the urban, yeah. the densest part of Providence? So I think there's a really nice example. So for instance, you see some of the tracks on the east side where it's a little bit wealthier. You see some, some bluer colors, I think that's not surprising. But if you look in the rest of the city, for instance, up in the northwest of Providence proper, kind of up by Rhode Island College or Providence College, you see some neighborhoods that are uh, pretty blue. They're not expensive neighborhoods to live in. Not, not the cheapest, but they're not expensive neighborhoods to live in. And these places are putting poor kids on really the same trajectory, if not better trajectories, than neighborhoods on the east side. You see some similar neighborhoods kind of down in the uh, on the west end, uh, kind of right down towards the bottom of the map. You see some colors that you know, kind of get out of that, uh, the, the deep red that are in some of the neighborhoods. And again, it's exactly as you said, this shows that there are places in the city of Providence, even in relatively poor communities, which provide opportunities to kids. And now our challenge is to go in and find out what is it that's going on in those neighborhoods that we can help spread that to uh, the places that aren't doing as well. So we only have about two minutes left. People are going to wonder, okay, it's a lot of data. They can definitely see what you're saying about the different neighborhoods. Kind of how is Providence doing? You've looked all over the yeah. country now in your research. What stands out to you about Providence? So Providence overall is doing pretty well. Uh, we rank about 12th out of the top 50 cities in the country. Uh, so it could be better, but the message is definitely quite hopeful. And that's especially true for children from uh, black households. We're one of the best cities in the country for, uh, for children from black households. Now, as you saw on that Providence map, there's still a lot of red. And I think, uh, our, again, how can we improve that? Some interesting facts that we found, a lot of times we think that it's all just about local economic growth and local economic activity. And of course, that's a good thing for many reasons, but we found it actually doesn't really correlate that much with long-term kid outcomes. And the intuition there is that if we create a lot of great paying jobs, but we don't train our young people to be able to fill those jobs, other people will just move in from elsewhere and take them. And you see places in the country like Atlanta where there's been incredible economic growth, but Poor kids growing up there really have very poor prospects. And we so, might have some, oh, go ahead, finish up. No, I just say, I, th I think, you know, our data point more to the value of education, they point to the value of human capital and mentorship within neighborhoods, really the fabric of the community, I think, is very important in these things. About 45 seconds left, we might have policymakers watching or people who talk to policymakers. They might say, well, what should I do with this? You know, I can go onto your website now and try to use it. What, how might they use it? Yeah, so all the data are publicly available online, opportunityatlas.org, and then the organization organization you mentioned, Opportunity Insights, we have a whole team that's set up to partner with different policymakers at colleges, cities, states who are interested in uh, using these data to help inform their policies. So, you know, had a lot of fun discussions with people around here. Uh, I'm very, very excited about uh, the prospects for these data for improving kids' lives. And hey, if you're a realtor, this is a way to sell a house in a part of the city that people might <laughs> you know, not want to buy right we've now. We've talked to Zillow about <laughs> like, getting these uh, statistics on their website as well. I could so. see it. You could have like the, like the bargain colleges list, exactly. the bargain neighborhoods list. That's great. Professor John Friedman from Brown U, thank you for being here with me. We'll be tracking this as it goes along. And thank you for joining us on this week's edition of Executive Suite. Remember, if you missed any of this episode or any other episode of the show. You can catch them all on our website, WPRI.com. We'll see you back here next week.